in this park. We've got an estuary of national significance, Florida Bay. We've got the largest mangrove protected forest in the Northern Hemisphere. And we've got uh, this behind me. We've got wide open sawgrass prairies, the largest such stand in North America. And these resources are singular. And these are the reasons, some of the prime reasons why the Everglades National Park was established to begin with. The significance of Everglades is it's surrounded by seven million people. It's also flat as a pancake and the 60% uh, of the park is less than a meter in elevation. And I love driving down our main park road because we have a sign that says Rock Reef Pass, elevation three feet. That sign really is uh, very indicative of the challenge we're faced with. Ever since I've been here, we've been wrestling with a lot of factors that uh, is part of this climate change issue for uh, sea level rise and changes in temperature, changes in precipitation, uh, changes in uh, extreme weather events, including hurricanes, and uh, they all have uh, different effects on this uh, ecosystem. We look at what the, the sea level uh, rise projections are, and that's a big challenge for us, is keeping uh, track of the science. We're at Duck Key Station DK where we collect data on uh, water level, salinity, temperature, rain. Um, we transmit the data through the GOES transmitters that goes via satellite every hour, so we know what the conditions are here. And back in our lab, it goes through a couple checks, gets pushed to our database, and then pushed out to the internet, so it's up on NDBC, so NOAA's National Data Buoy Center lab uh, website. One of the possible impacts on the park, when you're looking at a place like Florida Bay, is it, its effect on salinity. Florida Bay is a series of basins covered with shallow banks, or surrounded by shallow banks connecting to the neighboring basins. So as sea level rises over time, we could expect uh, one of several outcomes. One of them would be that the water level will rise and the bay will become more marine-like because the water will more freely exchange across the banks. Um, the other option is that as sea level rises slowly, the plants will grow towards the light with it and it'll bring up the bank elevation. And so in a sense, the basins will continue to have about the same amount of separation, about the same depth of water over the banks around each of the basins. And that would cause the salinity in the basins to stay somewhere near where they're at. So having collected water level data since uh, 1990, roughly, we're starting to have a, a appreciable time series, over 20 years in the bay. It's nothing compared to the 100 plus years that you have at Key West but it's still a long enough period that we're starting to see in the 20-year record evidence of sea level rise right here in Florida Bay. So our tide gauge again in Key West has been noting that rise two millimeters every single year more or less over the course of a 150-year data set and we know what's happening there. It's a one-two punch both the loss of land-based ice like the glaciers that we have in Kenai Fjords as well as thermal expansion is really pushing these seas higher and higher with every passing year having impacts for areas far, far away from those points of origin like the lowlands of the Florida Everglades. You know, we're, we're faced with some real challenges in terms of a freshwater marsh transitioning to more of a saltwater dominated system and of course the, the species would change. And uh, that's a real challenge for us. Coastal species moving further into the marsh is something that would be reasonably expected from a, a, a scenario with uh, increasing sea level rise over time. What we are seeing is the northward extent of red mangroves, which we think of as typically a coastal species. And to the north of us, we're seeing sawgrass marsh, which we typically think of as a freshwater species. One of the tasks that I've worked on is to conduct uh, inventories for rare plant species in the coastal areas of the park. And what I'm trying to do is figure out where those are, how many there are, and also make a, an assessment of what the potential impacts of climate change and sea level rise may be on those species. Um, in some cases, the species are, for example, epiphytic orchids or orchids that grow on other plants. Um, and those probably wouldn't be directly affected by sea level rise, but the plants that they grow on may be affected in the, in the scenario of increased salinity. So the expansion of mangroves in the park may actually increase the amount of habitat available for those rare plant species and they may, be, may become less rare over time. The mangrove forest here in Everglades National Park is absolutely massive in scope. These forests are perhaps our single best ability down here in South Florida to sequester carbon. The trees are neither exceptionally tall nor are they especially girthy. Um, 
You know, the difference is when you're walking through a grove, for example, in Sequoia National Park, you see all that biomass above ground, huge trunks of trees. Well, the mangrove systems store the majority of their biomass well beneath the water surface. And that's where it's held and retained within that thick tangle of roots before eventually being exported into the estuary and marine areas offshore. Mangroves have been known to exchange a lot of carbon with the coastal ocean, but they're much more efficient at taking up carbon than terrestrial forest. So terrestrial forest will build up carbon, and then that carbon that's in the soil is oxygenated, and then it respires carbon dioxide back to the atmosphere. And part of why that's important here is that um, not all the carbon stays here in the forest. Some of it is exchanged with the tide, and the tide comes in, the carbon gets exchanged into the water column and it gets taken back out um, to the rivers. We started to build this tower to get an idea of the amount of carbon uptake by the mangrove forest out here. And some of the most extensive forests are located here as far as um, this region of south, southern Florida. No one had really done this type of research called uh, eddy covariance or a flux tower research in this area of um, in, in the mangrove forest before. And so we're basically measuring the exchange of carbon dioxide between the forest and the overlying atmosphere. And if we do that continuously over and over and over, year round, then we get an estimate of the amount of carbon that's being taken up by the forest. Interesting question is, will they be able again to keep pace with sea level rise, especially in light of occasional disturbances by things like tropical storms and hurricanes? The jury's still kind of out. In some areas, forests are able to gain an elevation with the passage of disturbances, and in some areas the disturbances are so severe and result in so much soil loss that those forests are not able to recover. Here at Everglades and Dry Tortugas is we have cultural resources that are at risk as well. You know, we we're basically have a, a, a fort that was built in the mid-1800s, and uh, a moat was built around it. It's kind of our last line of defense, and uh, depending on the tide, it's got about three feet of freeboard. Dry Tortugas, it's a 100 square mile park located about 109 miles south of Everglades National Park. Dry Tortugas has many superlatives here, not just natural, uh, but, but also the cultural. Um, most of what people see is Fort Jefferson behind me. When you look at the damage of Fort Jefferson, you'll, you'll see the scars along the moat wall. You'll also see the scars along the main wall of the fort. It literally is at sea level, so we don't have a lot of margin of error uh, for that threat. And as good stewards of these resources, we have to be prepared for any uh, eventuality. We have challenges right now that out there with uh, big storms and losing brick coping. And uh, I'm, I'm always concerned about with sea level rise, uh, what kind of effort do we take? My hope is, is that um, you know, we're a place where people come, uh, they respect rangers, they respect people who wear these uniforms. We're a place where we can really communicate about climate change. We look at our visitors that come to these parks and every single one of them has a smile on their face and they appreciate these places as unparalleled areas of great beauty and endless sources of inspiration.